If you saw this movie called Men in Black, you know, the agents, you know, wiped out their fingerprints. Because now, if you don't have any fingerprints, you cannot be identified based on your fingerprints, and you have to rely on the old method based on documents, which we already talked about, can be fudged. You're watching Professor Anil Jain. Having solved problems for law enforcement agencies like the FBI and pioneered research in the field of biometrics, Jain is an authority in this area. In this conversation with Pankaj Mishra of Factor Daily, Jain talks about the past, present and future of biometrics. He also touched upon the privacy implications of Aadhaar, India's ambitious biometric database with over 1 billion records. When two individuals meet each other, you know, how do we, how do we trust the other party? And also same thing with uh, trust between an individual and a bank, as an example, or trust between an individual and a, and a government agency. Um, so, you know, hundreds of years ago, people lived in small communities. They didn't, the migration was not so common, and everybody knew each other. If you went to your local uh, grocery store around the corner, they knew who you are. Right? That's not true anymore. Right? So, and that's really why, because we cannot trust individuals that we need some strong form of authentication. Um, so first we got started with documents, documents or credentials, you know, like ID cards or driver license and uh, passports. But we can't trust them anymore because you know they are, these documents can be easily forged. Uh, similarly, PIN number, password, you know, uh, technically we are supposed to use a eight character difficult password, but it's not so easy to, for us to remember it. So the simplest password is the word password, or one, two, three, four, five, six. And so those can be very easily guessed, even though the total number of possibilities for eight character password is huge. Technically, people, most people use, in practice, maybe uh, 2,000 passwords, you know? Uh, so you, you take a random guess and it's quite possible that I can break your, your account. And then we have two-factor authentication. You have, you have to present a credit card and a, you have to present the ATM card and a PIN number in order to withdraw money from your ATM machine. But then quite often, again, it's the same problem. There's a skimming at the ATM machine and people simply use one, two, three, four as the PIN number. So that's what really is driving the biometrics market. The history goes back um, to, the, to an act of the British Parliament called Habitual Criminal Act, which uh, was around 1869. And the idea was that if a person has committed, and so habitual criminal means somebody who has committed crime over and over again. So the idea was to deter that. They said, okay, first time offender, gets a light sentence. Second time offender will get a more heavier sentence. And the question was, how do we recognize that this person we have seen before? Because criminals often will give an alias, right? They may not tell their true name, so you cannot trust based on the, on the true name. So that led to what is called anthropometry, namely finding different body measurements to identify whether we have seen this person before. So they may measure the you know, uh, length of the arm and the, some facial characteristics, you know, things like tattoo and any facial markings, a mole or things like that. So whole, all kinds of body measurements were made, kept in a register, and when a person comes in who has been arrested, his body characteristics or anthropometric measurements were compared with those who had been convicted before. And that was not a very easy system. There were no computers that time. So it was a very complicated system of recording these measurements and then manually comparing them. And then a discovery was made in the, in the early 19th century that by Henry um, Galton, individuals like that, that fingerprints could be used for identifying a person. Okay. And so, Around 1905, the Scotland Yard at FBI said, every, every 
criminal should be fingerprinted and then compared to determine whether the person has a prior criminal record. So this was a, one of the most major achievements in, in the world of biometrics. So for a long time, the word biometrics didn't exist until recently because everybody talked about fingerprinting, because fingerprinting was the only biometric which was used. Okay, so biometric in general refers to any measurement of the body, how it is used now, any measurement of the body which could be used to identify an individual. So every law enforcement agency, criminal agency, uses fingerprints for identifying a person. It moved beyond sort of um, uh, criminal investigation into also doing a background check. And then it moved into civilian sector, you know, around early 1970s, when people said, well, we should have some system for time and attendance type of application. Is this person coming to work? Or basically one-to-one -one authentication, you know, but they still required use of PIN. So you enter your PIN and then you provide your fingerprint or any other biometric measurement and it verifies whether the person who is entering the PIN is really the person who is authorized to enter this facility. So, so these are sort of different game changers starting from criminal investigation to civil sector and then the border crossing started. After the 9-11 incident in the United States, the United States Congress passed that we need to know who's entering this country. And so at every border crossing in the United States, whether it's air, or land or sea, any visitor coming to the United States must provide all 10 fingerprints. Okay. And these 10 fingerprints are matched against a watch list which is maintained by the Department of Homeland Security. And this way again we find out if the person who is entering is wanted for some reason or has some prior criminal record. And that, that border crossing system using biometrics is now used in a variety, in a different countries, even at the at the Bombay airport or Delhi airport, they, they capture the fingerprint and face image of a, of a person. Face image is not as reliable for matching, uh, but, but fingerprint certainly is, is better. So that was another game changer when the United States Department of Homeland Security said we should be fingerprinting uh, any visitor entering the country. Okay. And then the next game changer happened when, when Apple introduced fingerprint in the mobile phones. Linking this to Aadhaar, Aadhaar also does not release your biometric data to anybody. Okay? The biometric database resides in the central data repository. Okay? And at the time of a request for authentication, okay, so let's say you, buy, you want to get an LPG cylinder. Okay? You give the dealer your uh, Aadhaar number, and then the dealer will ask you to either put one fingerprint or one iris to authenticate and that biometric is then sent and the Aadhaar number is then sent to the central repository for matching and the response from the Aadhaar is simply yes or no. That's all. Okay. So in that sense, the, the information stored in the UID database is not shared with anybody. And that's one of the very nice features, and that's what is being essentially done in the, in the mobile payment systems, right? Except that in the mobile payment system, there is no central database. But in the case of Aadhaar, when you're talking about one billion residents, uh, you have a central uh, database. Maybe we'll gradually move towards a situation where your biometric it resides and the matching, everything is done on your mobile. But that gets a little bit more complicated. Well, the future is endless, okay? Um, you can think in terms of personalization. You walk into your home, okay? You have a sort of a smartphone with all kinds of sensors, okay? As soon as you reach the door, the house knows is Pankaj, okay? It will set everything properly. The door will unlock, 
the inside the temperature is controlled okay uh, it will give you any phone messages it will sort of you know if there are other members of the family using the same phone it will know it's Pankaj so it will only give the messages related to Pankaj rather to other members of the family this is personalization okay the television set will come to the channel which you watch as opposed to just uh, you have to turn on on and off so this is, you can call it targeted delivery of the service, <laughs> you know. So basically, now we are talking about a multitude of sensors, okay, where you don't have to actively participate in providing your biometric data. The, the sensors measure whatever is needed, okay. So this is, first of all, multi-biometrics. We are not relying on a single biometric data, you don't actively participate to provide your data, and, and so on.